Good afternoon, and welcome to our multimodality imaging um, conference series that occurs every Tuesday at noon. I'm uh, Miguel Quinones, and we're going to talk today about uh, stress echocardiography. And as we always do, want to uh, remind you that you are welcome to send us your comments or questions by via of texting at the Bakey to 37607. So the outline of our talk today is, I'm going to start with a brief summary on the how-to of assessment of regional wall motion. Then we're going to get, jump right into stress echo for the assessment of ischemia, the how-tos. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the value of strain imaging. And then we'll finish up with some comments on other non-ischemic uses of uh, stress echo. So in the evaluation of regional wall motion, the ventricle is divided into 17 segments, which we'll be showing in a minute. And for each segment, um, we do a subjective interpretation of the function of that segment by calling it normal, hypokinetic, akinetic, dyskinetic, or aneurysm. And uh, this is done by integrating both uh, an impression of the thickening of that segment, as well as the movement of the endocardium towards the center of the cavity. Um, this example is a, nicely, is a nice normal example. Now here we have a patient that does have some abnormalities. Hopefully many of you already are picking up on them. Um, so using the same uh, system, I'm going to help you a little bit for those of you who still don't have an appreciated with the arrows. So the areas that are pointed by the arrow are areas that are either hypokinetic, for example, there's still some thickening here, or akinetic, or maybe even a touch dyskinetic. We could argue about whether this is a little dyskinetic or just akinetic. Now, immediately it's good to remember that when we look at wall motion, the presence of either akinesis or hypokinesis does not imply absence of viability. That's a whole different story, and there was going to be a, a whole conference on viability coming up uh, in the early part of next year. So this uh, it's a, a diagram that was published years ago uh, in the guidelines of the ASC for segmentation of the left ventricle. And uh, basically, we use 17 segments. Uh, three for each of the walls, and then the apex, the tip of the apex as the 17th segment. Um, in each segment, um, the, a score is given to the movement or the function of the segment, so that one is used for normal, two for hypokinesis, three for akinesis, four for dyskinesis, and if it's frankly aneurysm, it will be a five. The sum of all the segment scores are added and divided by 17 to get a wall motion score index so that a totally normal ventricle would have an index of one. So we go back to the example that we started with. There is some movement here, so this is hypokinetic. This septum and lateral wall are all normal, anterior wall is normal, and here we have some Echinesis, so three, and maybe some hypo two. So we add all that together is 24 divided by 17, or a one motion score index of 1.4. And in the very early days of echocardiography, um, wall motion score index actually was shown to be a very good predictor of outcomes. And it was kind of neck and neck with EF. So that as patients, of course, have more and more depression of aviation fraction, they're also going to have a worsen, a worsening of the wall motion. So that score indices, for example, of two or greater uh, were predictive of kind of a poor uh, prognosis, which would be equivalent to somebody having an EF uh, less than 30%. So let's get into the whole concept of, of stress testing. Any, any modality that we do for stress testing is going to be using the concepts that are shown on this slide. And this is what has been called the ischemic cascade. So that um, if you have a significant flow limiting stenosis, uh, you're going to have an, a, a problem with coronary reserve. When the demands go up, the flow in that region cannot go up appropriately to meet the demands of that segment. So that 
is called flow heterogeneity. In other words, there is an abnormality of, of flow adjusting to the demands because the reserve is not there. So if you use flow-based technology like nuclear spec, particularly PET, which would do it very nicely, um, CMR when flow is being uh, used, which is not something done in, in every laboratory, then you can, you can actually pick up these abnormalities even before actual ischemia occurs. Because by definition, ischemia means that there's already now a dysfunction of that segment. So in theory, all of these techniques should be more sensitive than a technique that uses function, like ECHO, or, or CMR when we do it with, uh, just for function. Because regional dysfunction happens very quickly afterwards, however. So even though this is more sensitive theoretically, in practice, regional dysfunction occurs relatively fast when a segment is ischemic. EKG changes may or may not occur, but it's a later effect. And of course, frequently we, do, uh, we stress patients and have a lot of abnormalities, and yet they do not experience chest pain. So angina is a, is a much, much later finding. So with that concept, uh, stress echo is a technique where the heart is stressed, and we use echocardiography to uh, assess the global and the regional function of the ventricle. So in this case, we can see that in all the views with the uh, stress, in this case it was a treadmill, so right after finishing the treadmill, there is an increase in ejection fraction and an increase in the amount of wall motion in all the segments. This is a very old study done way back in the early days of stress echo in our lab, uh, but still showed uh, very nicely a very positive stress echo. So here at rest you can see very nicely uh, the movement of the uh, septum and the anterior wall. And a very nice uh, shortening with an ejection fraction clearly around 60%. Um, short axis shows very nice the same thing, apical for chamber, apical to chamber. So we had normal wall motion, good EF, at least 60 to 65 um, at rest. Now notice right after the patient comes out of the treadmill that the end systolic cavity is bigger. Now, now, now compared to now, now, now. So there's been a dilation of the ventricle, particularly at end systole. If you think in terms of multiple diameters within regions of the heart, those diameters also have gotten bigger. Look at, the di at here and look at it there. So it's been a dilation, a global and regional dilation of the ventricle at end systole. We see that also in the short axis. If you look at the short axis area at end systole, versus here, clearly dilated. And we see the same thing in a four-chamber view, in a two-chamber view. So this patient had a very global response. Of course, with that, there was a drop in ejection fraction. And it was a patient that had uh, significant multi-vessel coronary artery disease. So how do we detect ischemia using regional function, using uh, wall motion? Well. We like to see a transient, in other words, reversible, systolic abnormality. There's also a diastolic abnormality. That one, with our current tools, can be a little bit more difficult to detect. However, when people, when, in animal studies, when they are able to do more sophisticated measurements, it's been shown that the ischemic myocardium has abnormalities immediately with relaxation and, of course, with contraction. But the one that we normally see in our uh, standard stress echo would be the contraction. However, it's transient. It doesn't last forever. But it may last minutes or maybe even hours if there is stunning. Certainly in the animal lab, that can be shown very nicely. So the idea of a stress echo is not only to produce the ischemia with the stress, but hopefully it will be serious enough to maybe last one, two, or three minutes so that even after the stress, we can pick it up. And this is, of course, the, the well-known phenomenon of stoning. So in a typical treadmill, the ischemia frequently lasts between one and a half to even three minutes post-exercise. We've seen patients where, where even five minutes after, they still have an abnormality of contraction. How do we stress 
working hard. Well, exercise is the preferred method, both using the treadmill or the bike. If not, then pharmacologic techniques. And in this country, catecholamines, the use of the butamine, has been the most preferred, given that vasodilators like the pridamol or adenosine, although they can cause ischemia, um, they are not as sensitive. Now, if you're doing a flow assessment, like with PET, for example, then adenosine or regadenosine, which is a, an adenosine-like uh, uh, agent, uh, will be very effective. Now, you can help yourself by putting an adjunct. So if you're doing, a, for example, dobutamine, you could use atropine to increase heart rate and get to a higher heart rate, or even hand grip, uh, because it has been shown that isometric exercise in top of either regular exercise or dobutamine can enhance more uh, the yield for ischemia. So let's start with the post-treadmill stress echo technique, which is the one used most commonly as in, the, in an out outpatient setting. Um, the advantage is that one uses a standard protocol. Most people use the Bruce protocol. You have the information of the clinical findings, how long the patient stayed in the treadmill, any, any symptoms during the exercise, ST changes, exercise capacity, which are all standard. And then in addition, you have the imaging with the echo. Limitations are that of, the th of all three types of stress echoes, the treadmill technique is the most intensive for the sonographer because you're fighting against time. As soon as the patient steps down from the treadmill, you immediately start imaging and you want to get all your images completed and captured in your loops within 90 seconds so that you don't go beyond the time of uh, possible stoning. Remember that mild ischemia may recover uh, very quickly. And of course, you only have two stages, the resting stage and the post-exercise stage. The best accuracy is when patients reach at 85% maximal predicted heart rate for their age and when the post-exercise images are obtained, as I said earlier, very quickly, within 90 seconds post-exercise. The heart rate at the time of the acquisition is not important. The patient reached a heart rate of 150 and a minute later is down to 100, it's not a problem. So it's not the heart rate at the time you're capturing, it's the heart rate the patient reached during the exercise stress. Uh, this is just an interesting slide, it's a historical slide. Uh, this was our first publication uh, validating stress echocardiography with the treadmill. It was published in 1983, which means that the work was done between 81 and 82, uh, which is basically uh, 40 years ago. Um, there were 73 patients, they all had coronary angiography, and looking at either a drop in EF and all wall motion abnormalities, um, there was a sensitivity of 91% and a specificity of 88% in a kind of small selected uh, population. Obviously, after that, a lot of more studies were done by multiple uh, laboratories. And in the, uh, 1988, I believe, or 92, 1992, I think, we published this, this study where we compared um, stress echo with nuclear thallium spec using the same exercise. So on the same treadmill, the patient had both the nuclear and the stress echo. And we found an 88% agreement between the two techniques. And interestingly, um, the disagreements, 80 plus percent of those disagreements consisted of a true positive for one of the, of one of the two tests uh, that was missed by the other or a true negative that was missed by the other. In the subgroup of 112 patients that had angiography, both techniques had very similar sensitivities and specificities for detection of significant coronary artery disease, where significant was 70% or more stenosis. In the 50 to 70%, the sensitivity of both techniques uh, was not as good, and to this day, that is still correct, with the exception perhaps of PET, which has uh, outstanding sensitivity for detecting uh, abnormalities of coronary reserve. Uh, but 
most techniques that we use on a daily basis are significantly limited in detecting lesions between 50 and 69 percent. So usually when we talk about ischemia that we can pick up, our stenosis is of 70 percent or more in most cases. Over the years, a lot more studies have been published, and eventually uh, in 98, there was a meta-analysis done uh, with over 2,000 patients, again showing similar statistics for both stress echo and uh, nuclear uh, spect. So uh, this is again an example of another patient showing it uh, to go through the how-to. Um, what is it that we look for? And in this case, we can see again, this is um, a rest and a peak exercise. I, okay, I believe that this was a, a bike. And notice again, end systolic cavity looks normal here, and here it looks dilated. Look at the short axis, very nice small short axis area, and then how bigger it gets. Same thing here in the epical views. So evaluate end systolic cavity size, global and regional. It should always be smaller at peak, and worst scenario, at least same as peak. But if it's bigger than, I'm sorry, it should be smaller at peak exercise compared to rest, and worst scenario would be it should be the same as peak exercise as it is at rest. Um, but if it dilates, that is an abnormality. And then look for distortion of geometry, which is very helpful. The eye catches that very nicely. This is an important slide, which has also been shown in many other studies, but that original group of patients that I showed you in 1992 were followed for five years. And the majority of them were able to be followed. And what this shows is that both the uh, stress echo and the nuclear technique had identical capacity to differentiate the very low risk group that had either a normal exam or very minimal changes from the group that had uh, either significant wall motion abnormalities or uh, perfusion defects and therefore had a much lower sur uh, event free survival over five years. Now, one of the beauties of the treadmill is that uh, in the treadmill, one can also bring the data from the treadmill. So in this publication, uh, what we did was incorporate the stress echo findings, which is the um, exercise wall motion score index, with the ST shift during the exercise and the duration of the patient in the treadmill, and created a risk index that allowed us to even have a more precise estimation of event rates over a five-year follow-up. Now, bicycle is also a very good alternative. In the bicycle, the patient is uh, exercising very comfortably. Uh, it's a test that is easier on the sonographer. And the nice thing about the bike is that you get the resting image, a low exercise, a modest exercise like 50 watts, and then your peak. So you're able to see progressive improvement in function and or worsening as the exercise intensity increases, which we see very nicely in this example. So this is a four chamber view. At rest, it's a normal EF, but notice how it actually gets better at 25 and better at 50, which is an, a, an increasing function that you would expect with exercise. But then the peak comes in, and immediately you can see particularly regional dilation. I'm going to see if I can stop the image at end systole. There we go. This is your diameters that you could quickly, in your eye, pick up. And I'm going to now do it for the exercise. And notice how much bigger that heart has gotten, particularly in this region here. Now, when we look at the actual wall motion, it looks like the septum is doing OK, and it's really this lateral wall that is having the problem. So actually, this is a case of significant ischemia in a patient that had a large um, OM circumflex type of lesion. But the trick is, with your eyes, look at end systolic size, 
cavity and regional. And in the case of the bike, the advantage is that instead of comparing the exercise with the rest, you can compare the exercise with the lower level where you have actually augmentation of function, making a lot easier to pick up the abnormality. And then again, you can look for distortion of geometry. As you can see here, there is a little bit of a hinge point right in this region here. So uh, years back, uh, back in 1999, uh, a study was done in our lab where we had close to, uh, well, I, think, I think it was over 70 patients that had the treadmill and the bike and coronary angiography. And what we found is that for the treadmill, as we know, 85% um, of maximal heart rate is the goal, is the target when we exercise somebody. In the bicycle, the heart rate is much less in the supine bike than it is in the treadmill. But the blood pressure is much higher. So both end up with very similar double products. So when you do a bicycle stress echo supine bike, do not be worried if you don't reach 85% maximal heart rate. As long as your double product stays over um, 20,000. 20, and if it goes way beyond that, even better. So it's the double product that you are going to be targeting for, targeting for, not the heart rate. And the, the nice thing about it is that you get a much higher spike on your systolic blood pressure. Uh, yeah, 67 patients, they all had angiography. And again, you can see very similar sensitivities overall. One vessel or two or three vessels between the two techniques uh, and similar specificities. So the bike is a very good alternative uh, to the treadmill. One big advantage is it's easier on the sonographer. It's also easier for elderly patients. They feel very secure on the bike. They are not afraid of falling. Um, and it's also good for evaluating patients with dyspnea because you can assess the ejection fraction response, look for ischemia, but also you have time to do some diastolic function assessment, estimate feeling pressures with exercise, and pulmonary artery pressure response to exercise. So you can get a much more complete uh, hemodynamic and wall motion study when you use the supine bike. So co consider that in your practice. Uh, there is some expense in buying one of these nice supine bikes, but, I, but it pays off in getting a very good quality study. Dobutamine, of course, consists of infusing dobutamine pr uh, progressively to get a, a faster, faster heart rate and a more dynamic contraction, as you see uh, in this nice example here, to a point that you may get uh, cavity obliterations uh, with dobutamine. Uh, it's given in increments of uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. And when most people don't go beyond 40 micrograms per uh, kilogram per minute, and if the heart rate has not reached the 85% target, atropine is used either after 20, 30, or close to 40 mics to enhance the heart rate and get to that 85% uh, level. Now, when you get nice positive response, they're, they're great. Again, this is a patient with a significant LAD lesion, a four chamber and two chamber. You can see very nicely that at rest, um, the heart contracts very nicely. And then with the low levels and mid levels, this is uh, five mics and 10 mics, you get augmentation of function. But at peak, once again, notice the regional dilation, particularly in the distal segments. Very quickly, you can see that this is a lot bigger than that. So there is renal dilation, there is global dilation of the cavity around systole, and obviously that means a drop in ejection fraction. And then you can appreciate very nicely the lack of thickening and contraction of all this distal region consistent with the LAD in the two-chamber view you can see that the abnormality starts right about here. So it is a very significant lesion, uh, either proximal or very close to proximal. So with dobutamine, it's the same thing. You know, we look for uh, cavity size at end systole compared to diastole, uh, look for distortion of geometry, which you can see very nicely here, and so on. The problem with dobutamine is that if the heart is relatively normal and small 
at uh, rest, they can get really small with dobutamine, which can be making can make it a little bit tougher. Now here we have a patient that had actually kind of a global response. Um, again, this is at rest baseline, five and um, ten or twenty uh, mic. But look at peak; this whole cavity has gotten bigger. You can see nicely in the short axis view. No question that at end systole, that's a much bigger cavity than here. So this could be a multivessel disease, a left main, but also it could be some form of uh, cardiomyopathy uh, because it's more of a global response. But until proven otherwise, you have to think of a very significant multivessel CAD or left main. So again, summarizing the typical findings when we detect ischemia. Um, the ejection fraction response may be flat, which in that case, it can be more sensitive, but it can be more less specific. So if all you have is a flat EF response in a stress echo, be careful. You may want to suggest it, but you, don't, you may not want to go all the way out and say that the patient has multivessel disease. Uh, because some people, particularly some elderly patients uh, with exercise, they tend to have more of a flat EF response. So to be more specific and feel more confidence in your um, report, you like to see some global drop in EF, but most importantly, you want to see global and or segmental and systolic enlargement or dilation. And that obviously means also that there's new regional one motion abnormalities. In that case, frequently the ejection fraction drops, and then you have a much more str strength in calling the test abnormal and suggesting uh, disease in different vessels. Now, if you have a drop in EF with just hypokinesis but nothing else, then of course, as I said earlier, you may have very severe disease or left main, but you could also have a cardiomyopathy. So this is a 59-year-old person with uh, left main, and I, I use this to show you one of the subtle findings. Not all the findings are they come in like I showed you earlier cases. This is more subtle, and this patient did have um, a 90 percent RCA. Um, where the arrow is pointing. And what I want to show you here is that if you look at rest, there is progressive thickening of this segment, the base of the inferior wall. The base of the inferior wall tends to be a little bit less contractile, less mobile than the other segments of the heart. So even in normal hearts, there is a little bit of heterogeneity in the inferior base of, uh, in the two-chamber view. So that at rest, there is progressive thickening, you can see. But here, what you see is, in systole, there is no thickening at all. However, we do some thickening. We do see some thickening. Now, 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 now. But watch that that thickening is happening right about the time that the metal valve is about to open. Now, now, now. So this is a phenomenon well shown in the animal lab which is called post-systolic thickening, and is very, very specific for ischemia. And um, the theory is that the ischemic cell, uh, with the increased afterload of the systolic pressure, cannot contract. But as soon as that LV pressure starts to drop, that cell now goes, ah, thank you. And now it has this late systolic thickening, which occurs during isovolumic relaxation or very, very early diastole. So post-systolic thickening, actually, you can actually see it um, with digital techniques. You can slow down the speed of this image, and you can appreciate it um, more, uh, even nicer. But I think in this case, we all can see it now, now, now. And that is a very specific sign of uh, ischemia. Here we have a young lady who came in and had um, a treadmill echo. And I think hopefully you all can rapidly appreciate that address the EF, it's, yeah, you know, maybe 45, maybe 50. It's certainly not superb, but clearly gets worse with exercise. So in three minutes, she stopped because of dyspnea. 
It started with a heart of 79 and jumped to 176 beats per minute in three minutes. So obviously she's very deconditioned. And her blood pressure from 138 went to 153. Double product, almost 27,000. And notice how significant drop we see in EF here and here. Look at the two chamber view, at rest, and post exercise. Okay, so this patient has a global drop in EF. So she went for a coronary CT angio, and that was absolutely, completely normal. And basically, the story was that she had uh, a lymphoma and underwent uh, chemotherapy with some of the cardiotoxic drugs. And this basically is a case of chemotherapy induced cardiomyopathy with a resting abnormality that is very subtle. I mean, this is you know, I'm, I'm very mild, maybe borderline EF address, but clearly completely went to pieces uh, with just a little bit of exercise. And she actually had presented with uh, effort angina, um, dyspnea. So even when CAD is not present, stress echo can still be very helpful in detecting disease, dysfunction and explaining symptoms for patients. And again, I go back to emphasizing that uh, the bike can be a, a good alternative because in addition, we can bring Doppler in and look at other hemodynamic findings. When we look at the appropriateness criteria for stress echo, they're basically very similar to nuclear techniques. Uh, I won't go over all the details of this slide, but these are different type of uh, uh, chest pain evaluation with different probability for CAD, and in most of them, the stress echo is quite appropriate, just like a, a nuclear is. So I think we can summarize and put some facts together and say exercise echo is an accurate test for detection of ischemia and CAD. Multiple studies have shown that uh, it has a similar statistics to conventional uh, spec. However, its accuracy depends on expertise, and its expertise both of sonographers and of the interpreting physician. I didn't show you, but the accuracy of stress echo is limited in patients with left bundle branch block because of the well-known phenomenon of the desynchrony that occurs with left bundle. So we might pick up abnormalities. The heart may go, may go down with the exercise. And may, maybe that may not be a bad thing to find out, but it may not be because of ischemia. It may be because of the desynchrony, desynchrony created by the left bundle. Interestingly, uh, many of you should know that uh, nuclear spec also has its problem with left bundles of false positive. Um, so in patients with left bundle uh, branch block, uh, presenting with symptoms suggesting in, uh, chest pain, angina, and so on, uh, it may be better to go to either a PET or uh, a coronary CT angiogram because even nuc even uh, pharmacology expect uh, can have uh, false positive. The vitamin stress echo is an alternative. However, uh, it is less sensitive than exercise echo and than, than the nuclear techniques, and importantly, it loses sensitivity in small cavities. So when you have these patients that have like concentric LVH, concentric remodeling, tiny LV cavities, if they get so small with the dobutamine that it becomes very tough to interpret any wall motion at that level. You do, got, you do have more side effects of ventricular arrhythmias and even atrial fibrillation so that in my own practice, when I see patients that cannot exercise, I rarely go to the butamine. I usually go to one of the nuclear techniques or coronary CT angiogram, depending on the patient. Now, the, the, uh, the uh, situations where we do use the butamine are more like when you have issues with hibernation, where you're looking now for uh, contractile reserve um, that was going to be covered later on next year or in the situation of aortic stenosis with uh, looking for uh, uh, the response of a low gradient to dobutamine. But in the average patient coming to your clinic with chest pain and so on, if they cannot exercise, dobutamine may be an alternative, but, uh, but understand that you may be losing some sensitivity. If patient can exercise, do an exercise. And think of supine bike, particularly for some of these elderly patients that uh, may do fine on the bike, but maybe are you scared of getting into a treadmill? So I show you some images with contrast already. So obviously the answer to this 
uh, statement is that yes, contrast does have a lot of value. But should we use it on every case? And the answer to that is no. And actually, that was shown uh, very nicely in a trial that I'll show you in a minute. But let's start with this patient where without contrast, we might be suspicious. We might be suspicious that at peak stress, that area here may not be coming in just as well as here where it's almost cavity obliteration. You might be suspicious, but you know, it really requires a, an experienced eye looking really hard to try to make a decision. And yet, when the contrast is given, it was like turning the lights on. Now, there is no argument. In fact, you saw this case earlier. I showed it to you a little bit earlier, uh, where you see now clearly the very, very impressive apical abnormality uh, from an LAD lesion, uh, and you, we looked at this uh, frame before. So in s now, what's it, what is the situation here? Well, we have a lot of segments that we don't see anything. I mean, there's a lot of endocardial dropout, okay? And that's exactly what the optimized trial showed. These were 108 patients, all went to coronary angiography, and they all had two stress tests, one without contrast and one with contrast. And what was shown very nicely was that when more than two segments could not be seen well at rest, that's when contrast paid off in terms of improvement in accuracy. If you could see one or two segments well, or all segments could be seen, there was not that much advantage of contrast. And in fact, sometimes if you have a nice quality image at rest and you put contrast, the contrast can create some artifacts that can make your life more difficult. So contrast is very valuable, but it should be used in patients that have more than two segments um, that cannot be properly visualized. Strain. Well, one would think that strain would be absolutely fantastic. If you remember my talk uh, a few weeks ago on left ventricular function, um, we brought strain into, and we talked about how st global strain is more sensitive than ejection fraction, and that uh, we can look at a bull size and see regional abnormalities, and these regional abnorm abnormalities can sometimes uh, predict uh, world motion abnormalities and, and coron coronary artery lesions and whatnot. And in fact, in this uh, nice slide from a study by Perk, uh, it shows you the classic uh, normalities that you see with a bad LAD lesion, uh, a bad RCA lesion, or a circumflex lesion. Now, the question is, it should make sense to apply this to stress echo and therefore in perhaps in enhanced the diagnostic accuracy. So this is one study that was done in 2016. And they uh, use the eye. Here we have a nice apical abnormality, so this is a positive stress echo. And they use the, the strain, so here's the, the changes. This is a, no, a relatively normal bullseye address, and then significant change at peak exercise consistent with an LAD lesion. Very nice, okay? So what they did is that they brought in three experts and two fellows. And they had each of them assess the dobutamine stress echo without this, the strain and then in a random fashion so that they were all uh, not biased, look at strains. And what they found was that overall um, the strain did improve the sensitivity a bit. For example, a fellow one um seventy nine percent okay went to eighty nine percent with strain imaging, but the specificity was a problem uh, and again if they were not the greatest findings um, this is better because this is a meta analysis so thirteen studies nine hundred seventy eight patients. In 10 of the 13, they used coronary angiography, and they pulled all the um, areas under the curve. And the bottom line that they found on the meta-analysis is that using strain um, had a 92% um, accuracy, 
versus visual 83%. Sensitivity was higher with the strain, 88 versus 74. Specificities were similar at 80-83%. So yes, it, it, like it made sense, they found the same thing. That's the good news. That's the good news. What is the bad news? It practically only can be used with dobutamine. Imagine trying to do this in, when somebody steps out of a treadmill. I mean, you're getting these images. Uh, if, you get, if you capture some fantastic images, you might be able to do some post-processing uh, and look at strain. But it's certainly a lot tougher to do. Maybe in a bike, if you have a super nice quality image patient, you might be able to do it. So there's some limitations in what kind of stress modalities we can use. You need great quality images, which of course we don't have in most places, certainly not in Texas. So in Texas, we end up using contrast in about 40% or so, even 50% at times of our stress echoes. And once you give contrast, strain cannot be used. So. Um, although you get this nice data in these publications, on a day-to-day -day practical basis, there's still some issues with contrast. If the day comes that the, um, the computer technology used for processing the digital images for strain can be applied to an image with contrast, then strain could certainly come up very quickly and, and become a, a, a good adjunct to, uh, to stress echo to what we do with the eye. So we're finishing now with a few thoughts, and we already have given some of those thoughts on um, non-ischemic uses. So certainly, uh, we talked about people with dyspnea. If people with dyspnea have a global drop in EF, obviously the first thing you're going to do is look at their coronaries. But don't be surprised if they're normal, because you may be picking up a cardiomyopathy. In addition to detection, uh, there has been some studies that stress echo with dobutamine may help you um, anticipate or predict the response of the patient to therapy over the next 6 to 12 months. This was a very nice study, small study, but uh, these were all people with non-ischemic cardiomyopathies presenting for the first time. And this is a group that with dobutamine had a nice response on their ejection fraction and then six months later at rest, they all had a very nice improvement where this group barely did much with the EF. Some did go up, but most of them had very modest changes and they all kind of remain with depressed EF at six months. So um, do we need that? We may or may not. It may be something very selective, but there may be times and you have, uh, let's say, a young woman that had a post, post um, partum cardiomyopathy, they're doing okay, they're class two now, but their EF is 30%, and you, and they say, doc, what are my chances that I'll recover from this? And you s might say, well, I told you what, let's do this little test and see if that can help us. And uh, if they accentuate with dobutamine and their EF goes to 50, uh, then there's a decent chance that six months to 12 months later, they're going to have an improvement. So that's something to keep in mind. Myocardial viability obviously is a big area and um, Dr. Zogby is going to cover that in January 4. We're going to have a whole session on, on viability with echo and nuclear and, and CMR. Um, the diastolic stress test is another important use and I, I alluded to it when I talk about the fact that on a supine bike uh, we can also assess pulmonary pressures and uh, feeding pressures. Uh, Dr. Naga is going to probably expand more on that uh, in, when he gives his talk on diastology on uh, January 11. And then, of course, hemodynamic assessment that we can do with exercise for mitral stenosis, look at the response of the gradient and the pulmonary pressures, very practical. When you have patients that have borderline values, patient is symptomatic, address their heart rate is 65 or 70, and they have a gradient of five, but you put them on the bike, you exercise them, and lo and behold, once the heart rate goes to 100, that gradient jumps to 16, 17, 18, and the peer pressure jump up, and you have a diagnosis immediately that the mitral stenosis is, in fact, uh, significant and causing symptoms. Um, pulmonary hypertension, situation where you may want to uh, have patients that have mild to moderate PA pressure elevation at rest, and you want to see how, how high they go with exercise. And of course, the aortic stenosis story that 
uh, is well known now and where dobutamine can be used to increase the cardiac output and see the response of the patients that have low gradients at rest and see if they have a, a significant increase in the gradient. In fact, it is used as one of the criteria today for elderly patients to uh, decide on the uh, use of a TAVR. So certainly these are all uh, important applications that are in the non-ischemic uh, uh, department and that we uh, frequently use. So we're going to stop at this time. Thank you much for your attention. And we have some time to look at uh, questions. So I'm looking into, and let's see. There's one question here saying, um, you're acquiring images while the patient is standing in the, in the recovery. What time frames after we should consider that these images are not stress, stress accurate? OK. So I think the question has to do with the actual um, how-to of the treadmill technique. So on the treadmill technique, you do all your resting images with the patient supine, in the, lying in their left lateral position as, the, as we normally do a resting echo. Then they go into the treadmill. They'll do the treadmill like you always do, using most of the time the Bruce protocol. Uh, once they get to the peak exercise, you instruct them that as soon as the treadmill starts stopping, to as quickly as they can, and, and frequently the, the staff helps them so that they don't fall, as quickly as they can, they come out of the treadmill and they lay down again in the left lateral position, and the sonographer immediately starts imaging. If you actually time it, it takes about 15 to 20 seconds for that movement of the patient back to the, to the examining table happens. So when you're starting to image, you already are between 15 to 20 seconds behind. And then you have another full minute, maybe a minute and 10 seconds or so, ideally, to capture all your four views. Um, some people start with parastandard first. Some people start with apical first. That's a matter of convenience. But you want to get your four basic images, the apical long axis or parastandard long axis, the short axis, the four chamber and two chamber as quickly as you can. Now, sometimes you go beyond the 90 seconds and you still can pick up ischemia because the stoning phenomenon may last more than uh, 90 seconds. But since you don't know that, ideally you want to try to capture everything uh, within that one and a half, one and minute and 10 seconds because again, you have lost already about 20 seconds just walking the patient uh, back from the treadmill right into the uh, examining table. So um, let's see, do we have any other questions? Can you, is that the only question we have received? Uh, what is the significance and import, importance of blood pressure response during exercise in a treadmill stress echo? That's a good question, actually. Um, in fact, we have a case, I would have shown you a case that I didn't, but we have it in our files, very interesting case of a patient that actually had atrial fibrillation and the doctor ordered uh, a treadmill stress echo. So the patient went in and exercised, and after the exercise, um, laid down, and we did the imaging, heart rate was about 160, and blood pressure was 200. So this ventricle was going very fast and going after a very high afterload, and globally, it fell apart. So the aviation fraction dropped, um, uh, but it was global. Of course, patient was in the right age for chronic disease, so I, uh, the, uh, underwent a geography, it was completely normal. So uh, under situations of very, very high afterload, particularly the combination of a very high afterload with high blood pressure, one could potentially see um, a depression, a global depression of function. Um, now, it's not common. I mean, most regular adults who are in relatively good health and can exercise, even if they reach a blood pressure of 220 or whatever in the treadmill, they still are going to look okay. They may have a flat EF response, but they rarely will drop. This was a unique case because in addition, there was the atrial fib that put them in a very fast heart rate. So from a practical clinical point of view, usually you need to have the fast heart rate and the very high afterload of the blood pressure to produce maybe a false positive, although perhaps it's not so much false positive. Perhaps that patient does have some element of myocardial dysfunction that one needs to kind of look more into. But that's the combination that 
more like more often will give you a drop in EF without having significant CID. Most of the time, if you have a global response to the stress echo to the exercise, there is some form of cardiomyopathy uh, that is being uh, uncovered by the by the test. Um, let's see. The patient on chemo who had a positive stress echo with normal coronary is, is that microVD. Uh, I don't know what they meant by micro VD. Micro. Oh, you're talking perhaps of microvascular disease. Ah, okay. I don't know. We don't know. Uh, that's a very good question, actually. We now have PET in our department, and actually that's an area that we would be looking into because with PET, as you know, we can now up look at coronary reserve uh, of the microvasculature. So I think it's a good question, but I honestly don't know the answer. Um, can we use stress echo to diagnose early cardiomyopathy or early anthracycline toxicity by lack of augmentation of EF with exercise? Um, I show you uh, data. I, I, I show you an N of one. So, so chances are we could. I am not yet aware of any good big series to look into that. And I think the reason we don't see a big series is that strain at rest has kind of taken over because most chemotherapy toxicity can be picked up by a drop in strain before a drop in EF. Now, the question you're asking is really a great question. If you have a patient with chemo that the strain drops, to, let's say, from 18 to 15, which is a significant drop, and then you put that patient on a treadmill, would you see a, a global response of the EF on the treadmill? And the answer is perhaps, but we don't know. I'm not familiar with any large series that has looked into that, but it's a great question. Um, any other questions coming through? Okay, it looks like uh, those are the few questions we had to answer in that case. Thank you all very much for your attention, and uh, we'll see you next time.